Gentlemen, we're going to begin. Um, I'm Hugo Gurdon, editor of the Washington Examiner. I'm very glad to welcome you all here um, and to welcome our panelists. Um, you know that when free speech banners are being burned at Berkeley, where 50 years ago they were being held aloft, that uh, we've reached an inflection point and something dramatic has changed. And uh, at the Washington Examiner, we realized that one can no longer, in editorial, simply uh, cite what is going on and say there's something that certain activities or demands uh, contravene the First Amendment because people say yes that's what we intend we intend to con we, we intend to end free speech um, so we have reached a cultural inflection point and it's no longer possible to suggest that when people come out of the campuses believing that free speech is, uh, is a bad idea that they will be changed by the real world what is happening what we what we're seeing is people coming out of campuses and changing the society and so Free speech, uh, particularly on campus, is going to be something which the Washington Examiner, with Red Alert Politics, which is now part of the Washington Examiner and has been for just the past month, are going to be focusing on with uh, great effort uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I want to thank our sponsors, the Fund for American Studies, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and Turning Point USA for uh, joining us and working with us uh, on this event um, and we hope that we're going to do a great deal more, a great many more over the course of the coming year. Um, we're going to start off with a clip from the No Safe Spaces movie and I would, you're getting a sneak peek, this is not an official trailer, uh, turn off your phones, although this isn't a movie theatre, we'll pretend that it is and if you were to make a bootleg and, and uh, take this we'd be throwing you out. Uh, I, uh, we're going to go to the clip, and then once we've once we've done that, we're going to go straight to our first panel discussion. The last thing I want to point out is that, or to mention, is that the panel will be moderated by Lauren Cooley, who is the uh, editor of the new vertical Red Alert Politics within WEX, and she'll be introducing our panelists. Please, please uh, give them a welcome and uh, enjoy the clip. Thanks. Coming here today to really have this discussion about free speech, about free speech on college campuses. Um, I know myself as someone who recently graduated from undergrad and is quasi semi pursuing a master's degree while I work. I'm not on campus every day anymore, but I, I find that there's this continual slippery slope where free speech is. Uh, no longer a popular thing, no longer the status quo, and so I'm very excited to see that there are so many different organizations and individuals who are recognizing this, um, coming on board to have this conversation. I'm excited that you're here as well uh, to talk about this important thing, campus free speech. So quickly, I'm actually, I'm not going to introduce our panel, I'm going to let our panel introduce themselves, um, but we have the Dennis Prager, who honestly needs no introduction, but I'll let him talk about his current projects. We've got Chandler Thornton with CRNC, and we've got Rod Marine as well. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about who you are, what your organizations are, it'd be fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you all. Uh, I, uh, I, I always wondered, was there a reality do that the speaker is brilliant in direct proportion to distance traveled? So if that's the case, I am your speaker today. I came in from LA because I always remember when people say, if you were local, you know, people didn't have as much respect. It's wonderful to be here. This is a very important subject, very briefly, uh, in no order of importance, because all, all these things I hope are important. I, I have founded Prager University, which this year uh, will have 600 million views. I think it's the largest conservative video site uh, in the world. And uh, the greatest single demographic is under 35 years of age. Our intent is to change minds in five minutes. Change minds. It's very important because if we don't win minds, we, we lose. And I'm with No Safe Spaces, and I just wanted to note the presence here of the folks from the Capital, Re Capital Research, Jay Klein and Scott Walter, who are, really are very much making this possible, this movie that I'm making with Adam Carolla and some terrific people uh, are producing it. This is a big deal because the average American doesn't know what's happening. 
And finally, aside from my national radio show, I just want to mention one more thing, if I may. The greatest project of my life, I've written seven books. They're all dear to me like children. But this is the dearest to me. On April 2nd, the first volume of my commentary on the first five books of the Bible is coming out. It's called The Rational Bible. And it is my intent to show through reason alone that it is a, that the that the the first five books are indeed not man-made, that they are ultimately books from God Himself. I know that that is not popular in in American life today, but the Lincoln believed it, and he was not known as overtly religious. But that that's been it's, it's been my my project for the last thirty-five years, and Volume One is coming out. In April. I know that was too long, but not nevertheless, at all. Not at all. I. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you to the Washington Examiner for having us, and really excited about the new partnership uh, that we have, and I want to applaud the Washington Examiner and Red Alert Politics for being a leader in covering issues of free speech on campus, and we thank you for that. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, I'm Chandler Thornton, I'm the national chairman of the College Republican National Committee, so this is actually our 125th anniversary this year. We were founded in 1892. We have a presence on uh, every state, on campuses in every state in the country, plus D.C. and Puerto Rico, thousands of college Republicans, and college Republicans truly are on the front lines of this free speech debate that we're having on campus. A little bit about myself, I'm originally from Maryland, not too far from here, and I'm a graduate of American University here in D.C., where I personally experience a lot of free speech challenges when hosting speakers on campus, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm Roger Reen, president of the Fund for American Studies. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary as an organization founded in 1967. We were founded precisely because uh, it was an era then that our campuses were touring with unrest over the Vietnam War, uh, civil rights, uh, there was violence on some campuses in the country, and the leaders of our organization came together to form a group that would bring students together for a summer or a semester in Washington, D.C. Uh, so they could, uh, they come from across the spectrum. Our, our students are a, a uh, great slice of demographics of the American college population. Uh, we have liberals and conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, libertarians, and we, we created a space in the summer for eight weeks where students can come together and grapple with ideas. They can debate, they can discuss, they can argue. Uh, they take courses for academic credit about our free market economic system and our system of government. What we noticed increasingly in recent years, as the students coming to our program, some of them weren't used to being confronted with ideas they might not agree with. They were made to feel uncomfortable in our programs when they were challenged with these ideas. And uh, we took steps this summer uh, to emphasize the importance of free speech, the importance of being made uncomfortable, of hearing ideas you might not agree with, and set that tone during orientation for our programs, and it truly made a difference in our programs. It enabled students to continue to have very vigorous debates, uh, discussions, uh, without feeling that sense of offense that is uh, so well portrayed, even in this short, uh, brief snippet we saw from No Safe Spaces. So I applaud the examiner for organizing this program today, and it's an honor to be on this program with uh, Dennis Prager and with, uh, the, with the College Republicans, which is an organization we work with very closely with Chandler and his team to try to recruit students to our programs. All right, so right away, the first thing that I want to just dive into is how did we get to this point, right? We know that there's an issue with free speech in general in our culture, but then even more so on college campuses. Um, you know, now you can't even turn on the TV, really, uh, with conservative TV, and, and not see either a show host debating a professor, a liberal professor, or interviewing a college student that has no idea about, you know, our original founding documents. Uh, you can't turn on the TV without seeing Antifa rioting on a college campus. But how did we get here? Because, Dennis, I know it doesn't take, uh, you know, years and years to create a documentary, but I know it takes some time. And I think you started this documentary before uh, this big implosion, this epidemic really came to light. So you obviously saw something that other people didn't necessarily have their finger on the pulse for. 
Um, can you tell us about when you noticed this was an issue and, and how you noticed this? I noticed it was an issue when I was a graduate student at Columbia University in 1972. Uh, it, it's, it's not complex. The left has no interest in liberty. It never did. From Karl Marx to the present, the left has never been an advocate of liberty except for sexual liberty. That is it. There is no other liberty that matters. Everything, everything else is suppressive. Liberals were always for openness. The left has taken over liberalism. The only liberals I know today, 99% are called conservatives. I am one of them. I grew up as a Jew in New York. On my birth certificate, it said, in the days when they believed gender was fixed, it said male and Democrat. That was on my birth certificate. There was no option. That is what you were. And when I grew up, for just to give one example of the antithesis of liberalism and leftism, and every conservative should make this point regularly. Ask every leftist you ever are in contact with, whether it's family, friends, or on a panel, or on television. Are you a leftist or a liberal? Then they'll say, what's the difference? Here's one. Well, here are two. One is freedom of speech. They, they, the liberals believed in freedom of speech. Number two is race. Liberalism was race blind. The left has taken over our universities and you now have black dorms. That's called segregation. That's racism. The purest racism since the Nazis is leftism. I'm not comparing the left to Nazis. Nothing is comparable to Nazis. I am stating, however, a fact. The most race-based, race is important ideology of the 20th century was Nazism. The second most is contemporary leftism. If a conservative doesn't understand that, he is fighting nothing. They have no interest in liberty. Wherever the left is, totalitarianism follows. And that is what is happening on our campuses. Yeah, you make a good point. I know that the left does a really good job uh, with their communication, with the way they brand things. And about 10 years ago, we used to call the left the progressive left. But I really have found that in the last five years or so, they've become more the regressive left because they're not really riding on campus for rights anymore. They're actually riding on campus to take rights away. Um, so Chandler, let's go to you and talk about when you really noticed that there's an issue with free speech on campus. And have you noticed that uh, the election of President Trump or even just the 2016 election, did that affect free speech when it comes to campuses? Well, we've come a long way since Berkeley was the epicenter of free speech. We've come a long way since 1972 when you were in graduate school. And I think that is really what's changed. And there are three main factors, I think, that have impacted this debate. Uh, number one, trigger warnings. Trigger warnings have had, uh, you know, they're inherently supposed to be a positive thing for those who have impacted something serious, like a veteran who's, you know, in, in combat or someone who's been a victim of something serious. But they've been taken so out of proportion uh, these days. Trigger warnings, number one. Number two, safe spaces. I think have had a huge negative impact on campus, and they're only continuing to get worse. Uh, and third, I would say free speech zones, which are inherently anti-free speech if you think about it. And if you look post-2016, we've seen an uptick in engagement across the spectrum. The left is energized, they're very upset, but we've also seen conservative students get very excited, very engaged on campus. So we're very pleased to see that. And we expect that to increase even more. And I think conservatives now, post-2016, believe that they have a champion and an advocate uh, who they can count on for free speech. Yeah, Lauren, I, I think it's important to recognize that, uh, as our Constitution says, Congress shall make no law abridging the right of free speech. Free speech was recognized as a right we have from our creator. Uh, and it's, it's a, so it's a basic human right. Uh, it's something that's vital to a free constitutional republic. It's, it's the beating heart of our freedom is free speech and debate. Uh, and then when you look at the university, the university is supposed to be a marketplace of ideas. Uh, you should have the ability to search for the truth without being hindered artificially through constraints that might be imposed by an administration. I would add to what uh, was just said that uh, things such as disinvitation, security fees are used to try to hamper 
free speech on campus. And that's why it's vital to have college presidents like Everett Piper, who was shown in this video, uh, like what we've seen with the Chicago principals, speak out firmly in favor of protecting the free exchange of ideas on campus. Sure, so one thing that I wanted to point out is that your organization does a great job doing almost what the colleges should do, which is creating a forum where students can debate and can explore different ideas. Um, have you noticed that students you interact with um, almost have to reset their thinking, their mindset, uh, in order to engage with each other in civil discourse? Do you see them uh, almost coming with this like mindset that uh, free speech is not, not okay, they can't really give their opinions, or, or does that not impact students you deal with? Well, I think the new wrinkle on this whole uh, movement against free speech is this feeling that we have a right not to be offended. That is much more recent, I think, than what Dennis Prager saw at Columbia, for instance, in the early 70s. This, this sense that if you're offended, it's some violation of your rights and that you should be protected from offense. That it's some sort of actionable harm that should be dealt with by administrators. And that's what we try to, uh, we try to very strongly emphasize <coughs> in our programs, that being made uncomfortable is part of the learning process in life. That's what should happen at a university. You should be willing to entertain ideas that you haven't heard before, that are contrary to things you might believe. And since we're presenting ideas of a free, free market economics, that's often something students have never learned, limited government. Uh, students, to our surprise, react with sometimes offense, if they're liberal, to ideas of a free society. And so I, I think that's the, the new wrinkle in this this whole movement that we have to be concerned about, this feeling about offense. Yeah, it's, no, it's absolutely shocking sometimes. Um, you know, you can see videos that go viral of students screaming and yelling, shouting speakers down. You can find uh, videos of one that went, went viral recently that we covered at Red Alert Politics was a, a, a student who was a leftist stole a kid's Make America Great Again hat, ran off with it, um, and then basically ran into the, the student office, the student offices, and, and went to administrators and said, he's trying to get his hat back from me and this hat's offensive to me. Like that she was in the right by taking away the hat and the kid wearing the hat was in the wrong. And the administrators are like, well, <coughs> they end up calling the police and, and I'm pretty sure she, she ended up uh, getting pressed charges against her for taking this uh, hat. And it's just interesting to me to see this, this mindset. It's not just a shift in do we like free speech, what is hate speech, having a discussion about it. It's, it's a genuine different worldview. Um, so, Dennis, let's go back to you. Um, I want to get back to the documentary uh, because you know, No Safe Spaces, first of all, it's a great name. It, it definitely shows exactly what the movie is about, right? We're watching uh, that short clip, and I see you know, riots and police, and it's, it's intense. So, 1970s, you're in grad school, you already see it, you know the left uh, does not like free speech. Obviously, I think that it's gotten much, much worse since. At what point did you say, hey, we need to make this documentary and we need to highlight this issue? It's a good question. I, I have lamented the decline of the universities for years. And when uh, these uh, terrific people who are producing the, uh, the movie uh, approached me, I thought, uh, this, is, this is perfect. Because I, I know there are many vehicles to reach people. Uh, there's obviously my, my first is radio and it's a it's one talk radio is wonderful and there's the printed media there's the internet but the power of film can't be denied and that such talented people are making this and i'm doing this with adam carolla it's a great example by the way by the way adam carolla and i if you had a book of opposites of of childhoods <laughs> I would be, I, I can't think of living in the same country and having a different childhood. He, that's how extreme the differences are. Uh, he, he was in a poor home, uh, which was highly dysfunctional. This is public. I'm not giving away any secrets. Uh, highly dysfunctional. Uh, nobody went to school. Uh, uh, he, he was a laborer much of his life and he, an atheist. I grew up in a religious Jewish middle class home, which was uh, not dysfunctional, just normally neurotic. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was a God-centered home and you, know, you just studied and you, you, know, you did what you're supposed to do. 
But Adam and I have identical values, identical. And we both see the danger of what is happening and from our own perspectives coming together. The hope is that this will awaken Americans. I see you, all of us, we know what's going on. I am shocked. Do you know that the word safe spaces has not yet penetrated most Americans' minds? If you were to say to most Americans, what's a safe space on a college campus? They go, I have no idea what you're talking about. So what, what is to us bread and butter uh, is, is never digested by the average American. This film has the opportunity to bring this to tens of millions of Americans who otherwise don't know it. And then they need to know it, and then they need to ask the $64,000 question. Should I spend the amount of money I need to to send my kid to college? I believe for the first time in my life, I don't think it's a given that you should send your child to college. I, I, this, is, this I know for a fact. If you do send your child to college, you are playing Russian roulette with their values. But as, as, as close to literal as possible there is a very good chance they will be committing values suicide by going to college. So that's how bad it has become. Their purpose, well, the president of Brown said this years ago, I was Brown or Cornell, I don't remember, and said, our task is to have you challenge your father's values. But that's a lie. If your father's a leftist, we don't want you to challenge his values. No, that's very true. I mean, I can speak from personal experience. I have friends that um, was pretty similarly lined with me in, in, in values and ideology, political views. I went to different colleges, some went to the same, and completely different mindset four years out of college. And I, you know, it, it's the parents say, Lauren, why, why, why is my kid not thinking the way you're thinking? You went to the same classes or did the same things. And I, I think to a certain extent, it's really these parents don't understand that if, if they don't instill their values in a way, not just we believe this, but this is why we believe this, so that you can defend it, um, students are more, more than likely going to turn out not just leftist or progressive, but far, far shift in worldview um, with this four years of what, what a lot of people call indoctrination. So Chandler, um, do you deal with students on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm sure you hear hundreds of horror stories. Um, can you tell us some of the, the worst examples of uh, infringement on students' rights for free speech that you've seen? Absolutely. Well, everyone knows the examples of the destruction of private property at schools like Berkeley, UCLA, other schools across the country. Uh, those are some of the most rampant examples, I think. But you also have instances where some conservative students are being stalked on campus, harassed for their, for their views. Uh, kind of body checked on, on the quad, things like that. A lot of these things go unnoticed. Uh, and you see conservative students, just because of their point of view, just because they believe in limited government, personal responsibility, freedom, they're fighting for these things on campus. They're being persecuted on campus for these views. And uh, you see this all across the country. I was just at the Heritage Foundation for a panel yesterday doing a similar talk. And I met a student at Hood College in Maryland. And they received a lot of slack for putting up posters with Ben Shapiro's face on it. Um, and the university started this whole legal battle with them. And essentially, to this day, this happened a few weeks ago, to this day, uh, those students are being stalked and harassed by people wearing masks on campus. And oftentimes, these are professional protesters that are coming in. I think that's important to note. We have paid protesters that are being organized by the left coming into college campuses, uh, you know, oftentimes being hidden, they're wearing masks, covering themselves, and they're causing uh, a lot of disruption, and oftentimes there's no regard for private property. Yeah, and, and another thing is really the administrators, on, on many cases, this is not always the case, um, will kind of say, well, these are not students on campus, so there's really nothing that we can do about it. They kind of wash their hands of it. Um, and so it's become, what, at least what I've seen, in an environment where conservative students in particular, but even just students that are interested in uh, rigorous debate in general, uh, really don't feel safe on campus, which I find so ironic because uh, the left wants these safe spaces for you know people's emotions. And in case you all don't know, uh, safe spaces literally include crayons, uh, stuffed animals, and Play-Doh. Uh, so these safe spaces are there to treat kids, uh, you know, college kids, and 18 to 21 year old adults, if you will, uh, like like little children. But at the same time, 
and the ones that are there to actually debate, actually learn, are the ones that um, are dealing with physical threats of violence that the campus says, oh, well, you know, this is happening off either off campus or these aren't student actors, we can't do a whole lot about it. Um, so you, you make a good point. So Roger, I want to go to you because um, you brought up something uh, with speaking fees and basically security fees. Um, this is a tactic that administrators use a lot to stop conservative speakers from coming on campus. Can you speak to that, you know, how that actually plays out on a daily basis? Yeah, I want to first emphasize uh, what a point Dennis Prager made, that it is very important to distinguish between the totalitarian, the leftists and liberals. And uh, I like to say totalitarian leftists. They're sometimes Stalinist leftists. But, um, redundant. What's that? It's redundant. Yeah, it's redundant. But there is this distinction, and, and there are those who are, are true liberals who, who support free speech. And I... I know, uh, I love this quote by Frederick Douglass in 1860, he said that to suppress free speech is a double violation. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as the speaker. And it's important as, as, as students in a university, as all of us in the general public, to be able to hear uh, a range of views. And what we've seen with some of these speakers coming to campus, threats of violence, threats of shutting them down, and the university coming up with the demand that the organization that's sponsoring the event pay a hefty security fee of some, some amount that they can't possibly afford. I mean, these are tens of thousands of dollars often. And it, it's, it's a way for the left to suppress a speaker from coming to campus just by threatening violence. And universities and presidents of universities need to very step forward and say, we will not tolerate any kind of violent disruption and uh, cover the cost of security if it's necessary for speakers to come to campus. Uh, Free speech is like any freedom we have. It does require responsibility. And I think it's important to emphasize that uh, that point as well. Uh, it's important, you know, I, I abhor that some uh, white supremacists going to campus to speak, I would be the first to show up to protest a white supremacist speaker on campus. Uh, but we, we, we need to protest these peacefully by take, challenging the views, by boycotting the events, not by threatening violent tactics against these speakers. Yeah, you, know, you make a good point because um, you know, I, I speak on college campuses often. Um, I'm doing a tour called Make Campus Great Again. And uh, people often ask me, they're like, well, well, if you could only say one thing that needs to change on campus to make campus great again, what would it be? And my go-to answer is free speech, obviously. Um, but then students will come back and say, OK, but I get free speech in a vacuum. I get it you know, hypothetically. But when it comes to actually playing out, say, you know, like Richard Spencer coming to campus, which you know, his organization has actually done a, a very good job of tactically choosing public universities um, and using that as a tool to be able to get his message out, despite the fact that so many people would like for him to be shut down. Um, how do we explain to students, especially ones that are not very political, that are kind of you know, apathetic about the whole ordeal, and they don't like, you know, hateful rhetoric on their campus, how do we explain to them that free speech actually helps combat that? Well, that's, that, that's the American idea, that free speech, it, you counter free speech with better free speech. If we can't make the argument on an American campus against white supremacy, then the, the American experiment is over. I mean, I don't understand, by the way, I really don't, this is not a rhetorical statement, I don't understand who invites him. It is, it is a puzzle to me because there is there is as much relationship between right wing and white supremacy as there is between right wing uh, and, uh, and 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 badminton. I, I I don't I just don't get it. I don't know why we're saddled with this. I don't know why he's invited. I don't know who does. Having said that, I remember I was very young, but I remember this when Nazis marched in Skokie, Illinois. They chose Skokie specifically because it had a disproportionate number of Holocaust survivor Jews living there. And uh, I remember the New York Times and the ACLU were adamant in defending the right of Nazis to march with their swastikas in front of Holocaust survivors, people who had their, their families gassed by people wearing swastikas. And, uh, and, and by and large, the, the American people understood that. These are the scum of the earth, but scum of the earth are allowed to speak. And that's that's the American project. That is not true in Europe. 
in Europe, if you if you say uh, Islam has not been a religion of peace, you are you are fined or arrested, and uh, uh, it, that is what that is what Ayan Hirsi Ali said, and she was disinvited from Brandeis University, ironically, quote unquote, a Jewish university. I don't know anything Jewish about Brandeis University, certainly not in values, uh, but the, nevertheless, uh, these the, the, their their leaders in the uh, in the suppression of free speech. So this is a, this is a, a sea change in American history. No, you're absolutely correct. So Chandler, let me ask you this: um, There's a lot of people who join, you know, call it Republicans or other conservative groups uh, because they care about other conservative values. Let's say pro-life or tax reform or what have you. How do you convince um, your college Republican members that if you don't have free speech, you don't have anything else because I know for me I didn't start out as someone who cared about free speech I didn't you know that I agreed with it I thought it was a principle you know that we adhere to in this country but I didn't consider myself a free speech warrior for me it was I can't you mean I can't talk about my conservative values because that'll offend you oh my goodness let me put you know my conservative values almost on the back burner while I defend my right to talk about my conservative values once I win that battle I'll go back to the does that make sense? Do you find with students that you have to convince them of that, or they uh, do they see that on their own campuses? Or I think network? plain and simple, conservatives uh, represent a movement that supports freedom for everyone, right? Freedom and equal opportunity for everyone. That's certainly what we do with college Republicans. We support a party that we believe is the, the party of equal opportunity and freedom for all. And I think we as conservatives need to make the moral case on campus that we're not just fighting for free speech for conservatives. We're fighting, we're fighting for everyone's right to free speech on campus, and we're fighting for tolerance, right? We're fighting for everyone to have the right to free speech. And I, you know, I experienced it at American University where I studied, I, I ran a lecture series actually called the Kennedy Political Union, where I brought speakers on the left and the right. Um, and it was a student-funded organization, and I think that we need to have more discourse on campus in order to win the war of ideas. And I think, you know, Dennis made a great point. Free speech is, is really the center of everything on campus. And without fighting for free speech, we lose the rights of uh, every other right that we have on campus, truly. Um, so I think free speech is the epicenter of the debate right now. No, I, can't. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Go ahead. Well, and, and if you look back uh, just over the last century, if, if uh, those who would oppose free speech had had their way 100 years ago, we wouldn't have had a, a women's suffrage movement. We wouldn't have had a civil rights movement. Martin Luther King wouldn't have been able to give his I Had a Dream speech. Uh, there wouldn't have been a gay rights movement, anti-war movements, and whether you support those or not, they're part of the fabric of a free society to allow debate, allow discussion. And uh, you know, it, 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 it's important, as Dennis said, to challenge those who oppose free, those who are liberals, uh, ask them, you know, about free speech, and to uh, I, I think it's a defining issue for someone. And and when you're in discussions with your friends on the other side of the spectrum, uh, free speech is a great hook issue to talk to them to get started on a discussion of what they really believe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So you, you mentioned a, a few historical um, figures or movements in, in our country that really would not have taken place without free speech. Um, you know, I think that all of us in this room can probably think of historical figures, authors, uh, thinkers that uh, champion free speech, whether it's John Locke that's uh, talking about maybe Hayek, um, but who are some of the people today that are the free speech warriors um, that are the ones that are really holding the banner of free speech? Obviously, Dennis Prager, Adam Carolla, but who are some other ones that we can look to uh, to you know, see what the, the warriors of today's free speech movement really, really exist. Any, well, yeah, I'd like to answer it in the negative. I'll tell you who are not warriors for free speech, and they are uh, the uh, uh, academics. I, I uh, for, for our film, two days ago in New York, I, I was in dialogue with Alan Dershowitz. You'll see that in the film. Alan Dershowitz is one of the 17 remaining liberals in the country, and uh, the rest have have opted to either adopt the view pardon amis a gauche, there are no enemies on the left, which is the vast majority of liberals. They're not leftists, but they don't understand the threat that leftism poses to liberalism. They still think conservatives are their enemy, when it's in fact Dershowitz doesn't. Dershowitz said 
correctly, as I have said. He said, I'm, he said, I'm a Jew. I don't care. You think I'm afraid of Nazis in America? Give me a break. It's the left that threatens me. And this is Alan Dershowitz. He's a lifelong Democrat, lifelong liberal, but he is, he is uh, he, and he was as severe on college professors. In, in order to be, to work at a college, especially as a president or as a dean, you have to pass a cowardice test. If you do not pass the cowardice test, you cannot be hired. The, I saw that in the 70s at Columbia. Students would take over offices and the deans would offer them cheese Danish. That's basically what happened. The, the, the worst offenders in protecting free speech are professors and deans and presidents of colleges. It's a moral cesspool, our university, and unless we are prepared to say that over and over, because just like big lies get belief, so do big truths. This is a big truth. The university in America is a wasteland. It is a moral and intellectual wasteland. It, it is the center of America hatred of Western civilization hatred. The uh, University of Pennsylvania English Department took down the long-standing mural of William Shakespeare because he was a white European male. Do you understand that? The, it, 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 it is pure racism and it is antithetical to the entire purpose. If, if Shakespeare is not, is not celebrated in an English department at an Ivy League university, it's over. That's why Jesse Jackson was a prophet. He, he, he marched at Stanford with the, with the motto, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. The left doesn't like Western Civ. When President Trump mentioned the protection of Western civilization in Warsaw, the New York Times said in an editorial, this was a dog whistle to white supremacists. Defending Western civilization today is a defense of white supremacy. That is how sick it has gotten. So you're asking for heroes. There are. But the, the, the biggest issue today is not lack of heroes. It's the ubiquity of villains. It's going to answer. Can you ask where we came from? It wasn't that long ago that political correctness dominated campus. But how have we gotten from this PC idea to this anti-free speech, trigger warning, safe spaces, uh, free speech zones. I, I think, you know, I'm just baffled by how that transformation is made. Uh, but I think that in order to, you know, fight what Dennis is referring, what Dennis is referring to on campus, we need that discourse. And I think that's the first step, in my opinion, is having a dialogue, fighting for an exchange of ideas. As Roger said, that's really what college is all about. Uh, at a number of levels, there are outstanding organizations working on this issue. There are legal defense types of organizations, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual, Individual Rights in Education, Greg Lukianoff was in the clip we saw, the Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, they have they go to court to defend the rights of free speech for students and student groups on campus and for professors. Uh, left, right, or center, they support the free speech uh, rights of people. Uh, and, and at other levels, College Republicans, Fund for American Studies, uh, Institute of Humane Studies, the Charles Koch Foundation is spending a lot of uh, grant money to support free speech on campus. And uh, you know, we, we want healthy, free exchange of ideas. We want left and right to have free speech rights on campus. It's kind of a, a separate level from the point Dennis just made about the fact that even beyond the free speech discussion, then the concern has to be also about the, the universities today and the, the dominance of leftists in departments throughout our colleges and universities. I, I share Dennis's view about the question mark as to whether you should send your children to college. I talk to lots of parents and I hear these heart-wrenching stories of parents, Wall Street bankers, sends his daughter to college and comes home for Thanksgiving talking about how she's so upset about the white privilege her family has. Uh, they get these ideas that turn them against the values that enabled them to have a successful upbringing and to be in college in the first place. Yeah, no, that's right. So we're about to wrap up this panel, um, and we're going to watch another clip. In the second panel, we're actually going to discuss some of the ways that we can remedy now that we've identified this, uh, you know, this problem, this epidemic on campus. But the one last question I want to pose to all three of you is, uh, you know, we live right now in a culture of safe spaces. We want to live in a culture of free speech. 
can those two coexist, or is it a one or the other situation? Dennis? It's one or the other. Uh, the, the, the no safe spaces thing is fascinating because it's, it's truly emblematic. I've spent my life, so my field of study, ironically, I was at the Russian Institute of Columbia, so it was communism. Ironically, it worked out great that my specialty was leftism, communism, and so on. And I realized at a very early age that you, it's not politics that animates, even though they're obsessed with politics. One of the animating principles of the left is a denial of reality and, and, and a lack of desire to grow up. Immaturity is, is a profound element of leftism. And this notion, my feelings uber alles, that is what a ch an infant feels. I want, I feel, I, I cry, I scream. But in the past, you told that child, I'm sorry, whatever you feel is secondary to how you behave. You can't scream in the restaurant, even if you feel bad. There are other diners here. Leftism undermines that notion. It is a desire to remain a child. Never trust anyone over 30. Some of you are old enough to recall that. I was When I was a kid, that's what we were told by the left. Meaning, don't grow up. Growing up is, is, is bad. So when you're told your feelings are all that matter, you are being told remain a child. And so what happens is our universities are extensions of kindergarten. That's all they are. The only difference between kindergarten and Columbia is the age of the students. There is no other difference. It is a kindergarten. And these, these are, that's why it's inimical to, to free speech and to everything that we uphold as noble. Because if feelings are most important, then nothing else counts. I would add that another difference between kindergarten and Columbia is the price tag. Very expensive. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, kindergarten is getting expensive. That's right. It's expensive kindergarten that we have. I think they cannot coexist, Lauren. I think that if we want to fight for free speech, we want to have the free exchange of ideas. We cannot have safe spaces in their current form, the way they are on campus. They just cannot exist. Uh, so plain and simple, if we want to win the war of ideas, we want to grow our movement, if we want to fight for freedom, we can't have safe spaces. All right, Roger, last word. I want a university that is a safe place for free exchange of ideas, for debate, discussion, and the search for truth. I want America to be a safe place for people of all religions and backgrounds and colors, to, for it to be safe for them to exercise their freedom as they choose. The left has created this notion of a safe space that protects us from our, our use of our freedom and from a vibrant discussion for ideas. And uh, we, we have to do all we can to fight this notion of safe space on campus that's been pushed forward by the left. That's right. So, all right, we're going to actually play um, another clip. But once again, let's thank our panelists, uh, Chandler Thornton, for the call.